Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can we get everybody in the room? We are a little delayed. I know it's hard in the morning, and I hope you felt good last night. We are about to start the second day of the Globsec conference. Want to welcome you again. And uh, all right. And I think we can start uh, with the first panel about the future of Europe, and I'll pass. Uh, pass on to the moderator. Please, uh, let us begin the second day. Good morning again. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name's Philip Stevens. I, uh, I write for the Financial Times. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to be at this conference. I first came here a few years ago, and uh, it was quite small. And I can see how it's uh, developed and flowered and uh, to become uh, one of the uh, preeminent uh, gatherings of this sort. So I'm very grateful and uh, privileged to be asked to moderate. Now, our brief this morning, or the brief of uh, our distinguished panel, is a very uh, simple one. All they have to do is to come up with a, a new vision to redesign Europe. So no problem there. Um, we, uh, I think, caught, uh, those of you who listened to uh, Big Brzezinski's, uh, I thought, fabulous uh, speech yesterday afternoon, will understand uh, both the urgency uh, and the necessity uh, for such a project. Um, what I'm going to do, if uh, that's OK, is I'm going to spend um, a minute or two just trying to frame some of the questions before uh, turning to our panel, and I think one of the start, I think the starting point is: Are we going? Are we as Europeans going to be able to raise our sights uh, above the eurozone crisis that's consumed our energies uh, and much else in the last two or three years? Um, I think we can say that the crisis of the euro um, uh, is over. Uh, but the crisis in the euro uh, is still very much with us. Um, what I mean by that is what uh, the existential threat to the euro that we, uh, we saw last year has gone, but the threat within the euro to our economies, to our polities, is still there. So we need more growth. Um, just as importantly, Governments need to align economics with politics. What's clear in many countries is that uh, we're losing political consent for the sort of economic policies uh, that the Eurozone's uh, um, pursuing. I think the second issue is about the architecture of this new union. Um, is it going to be, we have a half-completed monetary union, um, is this new union going to be a more, much more closely integrated union, or is it going to be more ad hoc, more intergovernmental, um, more a, 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 a union of, of states uh, rather than uh, a European union itself? And I think within this framework, we have to ask whether leadership is going to be shared, um, or is it really going to devolve, as it has done in the last year or so, to one country, uh, Germany? Um, there are some other questions. What does a banking union look like and all the rest? Um, there's one other question. Is my own country, Britain, going to remain a, a member of this union? Um, and then the third element, and then I'll stop, I hope we'll look at um, is uh, to follow uh, Spig's admonition uh, yesterday, are we going to really look beyond Europe? Are we going to look to our near abroad, to the Western Balkans, to the Southern Mediterranean? Are we going to find things that we can do even, uh, even as we tackle the Euro crisis? And are we going to look again across the Atlantic and, Atlantic, and as Spig said, um, try and build a new trade and investment partnership. Um, that's enough uh, of me. Um, I'm going to start um, with our host, Mr. Lightcheck, 
Minister Lajcik. And my question is a simple one. Where do we start on this project? Well, I think we shall start with a serious reflection of our situation. Uh, European Union is uh, going through turbulent times. We are uh, facing a crisis. But we also tend to exaggerate uh, our crisis. We uh, tend to forget that the European Union is uh, the biggest economy in the world, the largest market in the world, uh, in most cases the largest investor in the world, and of course by far the largest donor provider of assistance. Uh, and every time you get to uh, visit countries outside of European Union, you realize how obsessed we are with our internal issues and how much we tend to forget that there is a life outside of the European Union. And we also tend to forget that there are countries who need European Union, who count on us, who are trying to follow our example. Because even despite all this crisis that is often described as horrible, there are countries who are willing to join the uh, European Union to the south, to the east, and even to the north. There are countries who are willing to join the Eurozone. Yes, we are facing serious problems. Uh, uh, I would call it crisis of confidence. Uh, because of our inability to, to deal with our problems properly and uh, timely, we lost the, the confidence of, of markets, we lost the confidence of our citizens, and we seem to have lost confidence in, in ourselves. We must not forget that the European Union is our project. No one can take it away from us. Uh, and you, EU is and will be what we make out of it. Uh, now, do we need a complete overhaul or we need uh, uh, some partial changes? I would say that we are facing two sets of uh, problems. The, the first set of problems are those which are the result of our lack of consistency. That means we have created a single market, but we've never completed it. We have created a monetary union, but we left the economic and fiscal policies to uh, national states. Uh, we protected budgetary sovereignty as a mantra of national sovereignty, but we al allowed irresponsible governments to almost destroy European projects. We uh, want to be a global player, and at the same time, some member states, the big member states, never allowed the European Union to be a, re a real uh, player, particularly in, in the foreign and defense policies. So uh, this needs to be addressed, and for this, you don't need to do a complete redesigning of, of the project. Uh, and I think we started late, as we usually do, but now we uh, uh, have set on a go good course. Uh, what we need to do is to be consistent with implementing what we have agreed. Uh, uh, we, and the rules must be obeyed by everyone, be it big or small country. So uh, my question, of course, is what are we going to, to do when uh, France has already made it clear that they are not going to meet the targets of 3% deficit, so what does it mean? Slovakia is, is continues uh, to say that for us this is the, the law, this is the must, and we will uh, cut our budget deficit below 3%. But how are we going to deal with this? I, I hope we are not going to destroy the, the newly created set of rules. <coughs> but here I am, I am uh, optimistic. But there, are sec there is a other, the second set of uh, challenges Euro European Union is facing, which is uh, our global competitiveness. The fact that uh, EU represents 7% of, uh, of the world's population, 25% of the world's GDP, and 50% of the world's uh, social spending. Uh, is this sustainable? I don't think so. Uh, according to the Deutsche Bank predictions, in the next 10 years, uh, the Asian economy should grow by 140 percent, the U.S. economy by 30 plus percent, the EU economy by 10 percent. So these are the different challenges which cannot be adjusted by technical arrangements. They really need sort of redesigning the vision. But what must not be redesigned is, is of course, the European Union as a peace project, as a community of free and democratic nations which are uh, which is based on, on the respect for democracy and rule of law and which is based on, on shared values and vision. And my last point, uh, not to speak too long, is that EU is the community of 27, soon to be 28 countries. We cannot have 27 or 28 individual arrangements with Brussels. Uh, 
this, this would be the end of the EU. So we, we, mu we must ag agree on the rules which are applicable to all of us. Of course, we have different flexible geometry, uh, but nonetheless, it's one EU. It's not a 28 individual agreements. So I'll stop here. Uh, <coughs> Minister, so uh, excellent. What I took from that is we don't need a, a great grandiose scheme. We need to do some of the things that we said we're going to do, complete the single market, complete the monetary union, uh, restore competitiveness, and I took from your last comment a message from my own uh, <laughs> government about exactly. picking and choosing, dining a la carte, as they say, yeah. uh, in the European Union. A very timely, I think, uh, reminder. I'm sure you, uh, uh, you tell our ministers that as well. Um, President Ilves, is that it? We just have to get down and do the things that we said we were going to do. We need to focus and we need to, as uh, an American president uh, once said, we need to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. We need to sort our own problems out, but also keep our sights on the global scene. Well, I think we need to become much more clear about what we mean uh, when we talk about Europe. Uh, I think I'd like to see a moratorium on the expression, we need more Europe, without defining what that more Europe means. Uh, there are clear issues, I think, that we have to address, and we have to address them in a serious way. Uh, first of all, there is a fundamental incompatibility between following, I mean, having rules that one should follow and then a solidarity when people don't follow the rules. And so far, I think we've muddled through, but I, I fear a greater sort of disenchantment in Europe where uh, the rules are meant to be followed by some, or some people take the rules seriously and some people don't. I mean, in particular with the, with the, uh, with the rules on spending and deficits and borrowing. And, uh, and here, I, I mean, I think at some time we will see a, a, a fissure, a great, greater fissure developing unless we really sit down and agree on what we agree to do. The other thing I fear or worry about in the long term is that, uh, well, there was a very symbolic event last week. The last U.S. tank left Europe after however many years, I guess they arrived in, on the continent in 44. Uh, no more, there's, the fact that the U.S. is less interested in Europe, that it has pivoted to, to somewhere else, I think should make us uh, sort of slap our faces and say, what are we going to do? This is, the world is still Hobbesian out there. There are still real threats. Uh, I mean, we can talk all we want about so soft power, but there are powers out there that don't slap their heads and say, oh my God, I didn't realize liberal democracy is better than authoritarian capitalism. Uh, and uh, so I think we have to grow up in this regard. We have to think about security in Europe, and if we don't do that, then we shouldn't be surprised if some place down the road we're in real trouble with the U.S. having pivoted and, uh, and, our, and we sort of having dithered for years and years and thought that soft power is enough. Uh, so I think that, uh, boil it down at this point, two things. One is take security seriously and take our own rules seriously as well. I'm just going to, before I move on, I just want to come back just on one thing there. How many governments in this part of Europe spend more than one and a half percent of GDP on defense? Because when I talk to Americans and I say, look, you know, Russia is still a threat and, you know, as you know, extremely well, and they say, well, no, it's obviously not because governments in that part of the world are not prepared to spend money. And if Russia was a threat, then Central and Eastern European countries would be spending money on their own defenses. Well, Estonia spends 2.0%. Poland spends 1.95%, which is within sort of the <laughs> margin of error. Uh, and the rest? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll come back. But um, a, very, a, uh, a, a very strong message internally as well that uh, 
uh, those who call for solidarity um, uh, have to uh, play by the rules. And um, we're going to sort of shift a little bit, and uh, 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 Mr. Sefkojic, I'm sure, will give us a, a view from Brussels um, that we've seen, I think, in the last year or two, particularly Germany, which used to be very attached to the community method of doing business, move to a more what Angela Merkel calls the union method of doing business, more between governments rather than... There's a big question mark about whether there will be a new treaty um, to complete the Eurozone. Uh, when I go to Paris, I don't hear much enthusiasm for such a treaty. I don't know here. So, um, but anyway, perhaps you, should, you could give us that perspective uh, from Brussels. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Steve. And I, I think that uh, the crisis and the situations we are right in is uh, very much reflected in the motto of the European Union, which actually is united in diversity. And sometimes we are more united, sometimes we are more in diversity <laughs> over the uh, last, uh, last few years. But I still think that uh, very often, um, uh, despite the fact that the Europe is really a patchwork of different languages, cultures, and uh, traditions, uh, there is still, even in this crisis, very really clearly felt that we have uh, a common uh, vision which is underpinning our uh, cooperation and that, uh, that we have uh, been um, working and achieving, I think, what was so important for the post for Europe, actual the peace for 60 years, which never been uh, in Europe uh, for such a long period of time before that. So uh, I think this was uh, one of the reasons why the Nobel uh, Peace Prize was given to the European Union, which I really think uh, was not only deserved, but uh, came in the right moment, because uh, you ask about uh, the vision from Brussels, I can tell you that uh, over the last few years, uh, last few years, it's uh, it's not uh, easy uh, to be to be there, to be uh, to be in the center where you see all these uh, uh, very often conflicting interests, conflicting ideas, and of course uh, you are absolutely feeling that you are going through uh, probably the most severe, uh, not only economic but also uh, political crisis in the Second World War. And let's be honest, I think we have seen it, and I think that the crisis peaked uh, the, the last year in the spring, that we, we have seen that uh, this European unity uh, project was really stretched to the limit. I really had a feeling at that time that we've been very, very close to the, uh, to the breaking point, uh, but uh, in the end, I think what clearly prevailed and uh, what is very much underestimated by uh, our partners, uh, um, uh, our global partners, uh, by financial markets, but also by, by Eurosceptics. This was this absolute resolve, which is uh, reflected uh, in a phrase that we'll do whatever it takes to save Euro and to save the, the European Union. And I think that uh, from that point, uh, I think we have also to, to, to devolve the developments over the uh, last uh, uh, few years where clearly if there, if there is some kind of silver lining in the crisis, if we're looking for something positive, I think that uh, the, the structural flaws and, uh, and uh, structural design deficits have uh, been revealed in such a plasticity that they couldn't be overlooked anymore, that we had to correct them. And we are, we are doing them, and, uh, uh, and uh, we know why the generations of the, of the, of the politicians uh, been uh, avoiding just like that. Because we knew that there had been structural flaws when the Euro project was, uh, was put on the table. We knew that there are the deficiencies, but uh, uh, simply uh, there was not enough of a political will uh, to, to address them. And, and we clearly know why. Because uh, these structural changes, these uh, pooled sovereignty, this much closer cooperation is extremely difficult to do politically. It's extremely difficult to do from the economic point of view, and it's very, very hard to communicate these changes to the citizens and to, to, our, uh, to our third world uh, partners. But despite all these challenges, I think that over the last uh, two years, uh, we did in the EU integration, especially in economic and, uh, and uh, monetary union, much more than uh, was done since uh, the introduction or launching of the, of, the, of the euro. And therefore, I think that uh, clearly the designs, the, 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 the projects which have been launched to, to correct these deficiencies and to improve 
our structure and the effort to, to put the European Union, especially the Economic and Monetary Union, on the new pillars are, are clearly the way forward. What I feel a lot, because I am also responsible for the relations with the national parliaments and, and the European parliaments, that uh, there is one disbalance which we uh, already see we are creating by this deepening of the uh, cooperation, especially in uh, economic, uh, economic and monetary union. The more we are pulling the sovereignty, more we are deepening the European integration uh, in, in that field, more and more questions we are getting uh, which are aimed at uh, democratic scrutiny, democratic accountability, and I think uh, that it's uh, quite obvious that with the European semesters and with these uh, new measures we are putting in place this year, meaning that uh, in September or October the Commission is going to send the letters to Estonia, to Slovakia, um, uh, to France, send us your budgets. We want to see them first. We want to evaluate them, we want to yeah, assess yeah. them. If they are sustainable, if they are aimed at the, at the right thing, then, then you will have the big discussions among also national and European parliamentarians uh, that, you know, how can we complement uh, this new uh, pooled sovereignty, this much uh, more intense cooperation with uh, the clear, uh, clear democratic scrutiny and, and democratic oversight. So what I'm, going to, uh, what, I, what I'm going to say that I think that we will need to uh, have uh, the additional changes to the European design, and I think that if we, uh, if we build the genuine economic and monetary union, we would have to proceed with the political union, because only through that vehicle we will get the adequate transnational European uh, democratic oversight, and that this would be challenging for sure. The Commission will come up with such an outline, outline how we would like to uh, how we would like to see the shaping uh, up of the European Union uh, after 2014. It will be for the new Commission and for the new European uh, Parliament uh, to work on it. But I'm uh, sure that uh, the intention will be very clear to complete what we are doing in economic and monetary union, to progress as fast as we can on a banking union, and to start put the elements of. Uh, strong political union which we really need if you want to have this structure complete. Thank you very much. Thank you. One small question. That political union, would that be based around the European Parliament? There are people now beginning to say that, you know, after next year's European elections, the European Parliament is really going to begin flexing its muscles even more and that if you want to build a, a political union, you've really got to build it ar around the powers of more power for the European Parliament rather than try and keep happy each national parliament? I think that uh, actually uh, we already see uh, this process evolving right now because uh, with the introduction of the European semester we really increased uh, much more uh, the uh, cooperation in the economics field and when I am uh, presenting the country specific recommendation for example to the Bundestag and I'm speaking about the preschool and women uh, places on the on the job market, also the German MPs realized that mm, somebody from the, the Brussels is telling us what we should do in Germany. And I, and I was telling them, yes, we are, we are doing what you ask us to do, to be much more coherent, to be much more disciplined, and uh, this is how we are trying to advise all member states, including Germany, including France, including Estonia and Slovakia. And of course, the, the question there is, okay, but we would like to have a say in this process. And uh, for us, the European Parliament is a central institution because the Commission is accountable to the European Parliament. But I see how exponentially uh, the relationship between the national parliaments and the Commission is being built up. I mean, the, the number of opinions, uh, the, the involvement of the national parliament into the procedure is growing a lot. And this is, I would say, to the reaction for Martin Schulz calls the parliamentarization of the Economic and Monetary Union. So I think we went. Uh, very fast in the direction of better coordination and now I think we will have to find the working model where national and European parliaments will be exercising this democratic oversight over the executive in Brussels and over uh, the, the whole uh, economic coordination uh, process in the EU. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Frattini, um, you've had uh, deep experience as an Italian politician and former foreign affairs minister of both sides of this question, Europe looking outwards but also, as an Italian politician, the tension between the economic demands of the Eurozone and some of the domestic political pressures that countries uh, face. How's your, what are your sort of um, uh, signposts, as it were, um, out, of this, uh, out of this crisis? 
Well, uh, thank, thank you very much. Much has been said. Uh, well, I have to uh, stress in these five minutes five points that are just the titles of issues that, to me, should be taken into consideration. My first point is that we have to be uh, very well aware uh, of the progress that we've been achieving since the uh, Rome uh, uh, Treaty's signature. We achieve and we risk to take for granted great achievement like uh, uh, free open European market or the freedom of circulation. There are some that think about having a Europe a la carte. I disagree. If uh, only one stone like the Eurozone falls, very likely all the common house runs the risk to fall. So, I would, I would say it's not just the Eurozone, but all the European project is at stake now. The second point is that, uh, as been said, European project is mainly a political project. It's not uh, mainly an economical project since the Schuman Declaration in 1950. We have to bear in mind that if there is an European fatigue now, uh, we need not bureaucratic exercises. We need rather political leadership. This is the point to be taken into consideration to address all the issues that are uh, on the table at stake, including the economic crisis. This is not a political, this is not a technocratic exercise. My point number three, we have to try to strike the right balance between what we used to uh, call Europe uh, in uh, diversities in Europe and unity. While keeping a stronger united Europe, we have to take into consideration regional and even local differences, traditions that uh, is not, that not possible to consider only from the point of view of Brussels. Having been Vice President of European Commission, I'm aware of that. My point number three is that uh, has been said, but I want to stress this point. More European integration, having a an Europe better politically integrated is not for the sake of Brussels. It is for the good of our citizens, for all of us. And sometimes there is this kind of narrative we have to do because of Brussels wants. And this is the worst way to, I would say, disconnect citizens from European institutions. And, of course, the uh, president said, not only because it is for the good of our citizens, but because uh, our main allies need a stronger Europe. When I think about uh, America, United States, I would say we need now to build a new, stronger transatlantic community based on common values, or as you, we used to say, but not only to talk about uh, security, but only to talk about global trade, both global trade, security, foreign policy, a new transatlantic community is uh, what we need and our allies need, exactly because there is the tendency of uh, America to turn towards Asia and, uh, and China. My point number four, and then the last one. <coughs> Where is necessary to have more European integration? I can just indicate some titles. First of all, accomplishing was leaders in Maastricht, I would have to say, did not have the courage to agree. After a common currency, after a central bank, we do need, we badly need now, a political economic guidance. Moving from banking union, fiscal union, this is the true firewall to protect citizens of Europe. The second field where we need more Europe, more integrated Europe, is security and defense. We 
uh, run the risk to underestimate the perception of security. We run the risk to be only consumers of security at expenses of United States. This is no longer tenable. We have to uh, strengthen our capabilities, our capacity to cooperate. Division of labor is possible within a common project of European defense, uh, much better integrated, much better coordinated with uh, uh, our historical <coughs> alliance. The third field is foreign policy. Foreign policy is extremely difficult to better integrate because uh, the national flag is foreign policy first. But division of labor, uh, coordinating and converging on common interest, think about uh, Western Balkans, think about the Eastern neighbors, think about Mediterranean. Are these in the interest of a stronger Europe? Yes, these are in the interest of stronger Europe. So, and the, and the final point, uh, the final field where we have to do more in terms of political integration. I mentioned a, a field what, which was my portfolio at European Commission and we risk to forget. A common European policy on immigration. Immigration is one of the global challenges. Unless there is a well integrated European policy on immigration, we run the risk to miss opportunities and to face only the threats. To do all what I'm saying, we need to re-legitimize politics before citizens. We need to fight much better corruption, tax evasion, and frankly speaking, talking about the next elections in the European Parliament, I would like very much to think whether it is possible to move towards a direct election from the citizens of those that will be representing European institutions. The Vice President of Commission mentioned the Parliament. Is it tenable a situation where European Parliament has not the right of legislative initiative? These are points to be taken into consideration. Okay. Um, a good menu and a, a strong uh, uh, <laughs> final point. Um, uh, about legitimizing European politics. But I just want to come back to you on one thing. I mean, uh, I used to live in Brussels in the 1980s, and this was the period when Italy was the, the great driver of European uh, integration. Uh, so much so that uh, it was uh, after a Rome summit that uh, Margaret Thatcher's fall began because she tried to resist uh, this tide. I go to Italy now, and I hear Eurosceptics on right and left. Um, is, if you go to the Italian people and say, look, it's OK, we're going to elect European officials directly from across Europe and we're strengthening the, is that going to make them feel more European? Not only this. Uh, this would be one of the elements persuading Italians that having stronger Europe is in the interest of Italians first, then of all the citizens, and then, of course, of our common good. But this is not sufficient. Italians are frustrated because of some wrong narratives about the bureaucratic tendencies that are in Brussels, but are also frustrated because uh, they believe there is a lack of solidarity. I remember very well during the enormous flows of migrants coming from Tunisia, coming through Italy to go to France, the government of President Sarkozy decided suddenly, overnight, to block our border crossing points between Ventimiglia and Nice, just in breaking yeah. European rules this was a sign of complete lack of solidarity. We have, I, I, I was foreign minister, we had to make an appeal to Brussels and fortunately uh, Brussels intervened. This is just an example to say Italians believe sometimes is the minority, it's not the majority, fortunately. The majority is pro-European majority. 
But many Italians believe, oh, there is Brussels trying to impose what we should do. And at a moment, in a moment of need, they are in Brussels and they don't take care of what is happening in Rome. This is the problem. Um, thank you. Now I'm going to turn to Charles Grant, who runs uh, the Center for European Reform in London, a, um, a jewel um, in an otherwise, uh, uh, in a desert in, in London, in that it speaks uh, pragmatic, speaks for pragmatic pro-Europeanism. Now, I know he's a born optimist. Uh, <laughs> so, Charles, tell us, uh, <laughs> tell us how, um, how we should, uh, uh, how we All should proceed. All our panelists have been far too optimistic and far too complacent. Uh, I believe I'm a pro-European, but you may not think I am when you've heard what I have to say. I think there are three significant crises in the EU, economic, governance, and legitimacy. The economic one is very simple. Uh, the medicine that the EU has been applying to the problem countries is not working, it's failing. Excessive austerity is sh leading to shrinking economies, increasing the burden of debt, and it's a vicious circle. And this is what the IMF says, it's what most of the world's most eminent economists say. Uh, they say that Germany is part of the problem because the, st the peculiar structure of the German economy, which consumes very little, and the Germans are now cutting their own budget deficit uh, at a time when there's a great lack of demand in Europe. Now, whatever the rights and wrongs of this, and obviously I'm taking one particular line on this, the political consequences are very grave. There is a rift now, a fissure, which has already been referred to, between what I would call Greater Germany, which is Germany, the Netherlands, Finland, and Slovakia, uh, uh, countries that follow the German economic philosophy, and the rest of the EU. Uh, and the tensions and, and strains between these two, these two halves are, are very serious, I believe. Um, this, the, second, the second serious problem is a governance problem. Germany, for the first time in the history of the EU, is the dominant country. And Germans have had this leadership role thrust on them when they're not really ready for it, where they don't quite understand that leadership brings responsibilities. And they're, they're doing actually, I, mean, I don't want to be too anti-German, they're doing quite a good job in many ways and they do sometimes do the right thing and I think they will do what they can to save the euro. But nevertheless, uh, they haven't yet adjusted to this new position in terms of their language and learning that they need to think about the, what's good for the whole of the EU and not just their own taxpayers. The reason why the Germans have had this role thrust on them is because they're doing well economically, but France has disappeared. France is weaker than it's ever been before in the history of the EU, and that means that the Franco-German relationship, for the first time in the 25 years I've been following it, is, is, is in a very, very severely strained state. Uh, a, f a further factor, of course, is that Britain has disappeared. I mean, Britain is, Britain is less influential than it's been since it joined the EU in 1973. Uh, the least influential it's been. Because as Van Rompuy rightly said, how can you convince the room if you have one hand on the door handle and you're looking for the coat? That's what he said recently in London. Um, and another reason why Germany has had this leadership role thrust on itself is that the Commission is weaker also than it has been in the past. Technically, it has more powers than ever before in the new governance mechanisms for the Eurozone. A lot of new legal powers have accrued to the Commission, but its moral authority its legitimacy, its credibility, particularly with the big member states, has never been less, partly because it seems to be now in hoc with the European Parliament, and I'll, in hoc to the European Parliament, and I'll come back to the European Parliament in a second. Uh, the Commission is perceived by the big member states as lacking a sense of priority, lacking focus, and being too obsessed with its own power. And I hear even similar comments from some of the smaller member states, rather to my surprise. The third problem is a problem of legitimacy. The EU has always had this problem. It's not greatly loved by the people who live in the EU. And the problem is insoluble. It's a distant, faraway institution. It's never going to be uh, enthused about by the people who live in Europe. But it's, the problem's getting worse because of the Eurozone crisis. The Eurozone crisis shows the EU to be very badly managed by incompetent people. And this reduces what academics call output legitimacy, the, the legitimacy that comes through delivering good results. Nation states get legitimacy in three ways. They build a sense of community so that people think that the chaps taking decisions are the same as the, same as the citizens. Well, this, this doesn't really happen in Europe. And the more the EU enlarges, as I said yesterday, the more this sense of community gets diluted, the less people think they have in common with each other. 
Uh, the second way that states create legitimacy is through delivering benefits. The, the trouble is, those who really benefit from the, those who gain from the visible benefits of the EU, students on Erasmus programs, businesses who want to establish overseas, uh, people who like to go and work in other countries, they're, they're the elite. They're the rich, they're the educated, and ordinary people don't perceive the benefits, though of course we would argue that they do receive benefits in, in some ways. And the third way that uh, states establish legitimacy is through elections, so that you think you vote for the chaps taking decisions. Well, here my problem is with the European Parliament. The European Parliament has failed to become an expression of popular sentiment in the European Union. Many MEPs live in a Brussels bubble. They're completely out of touch with what ordinary people think. Look what happened this week. This week, the Council of Ministers said, let's make EU officials uh, retire at 67 instead of 65 and pay slightly more into their pensions. The kind of things that most people in the real world have to contend with. The European Parliament's voted this down because the European Parliament is a defender of the Brussels machine rather than being close to the people. So if I got one minute left for the answers, how do you solve these problems? Well. The, uh, the economic problem, firstly, yeah. Germany needs to rebalance its economy. Germany needs to spend more. That would help rebalance the whole economy. Germans need to understand that if the, the southern countries have current account deficits, that's partly because Germany has a current account surplus. And if Germany did rebalance in the, its economy and did uh, finally take the decision to allow a banking union to be established in the EU with a bank resolution regime, that would improve Germany's soft power, make it rather more popular than it is today. And the Germans are right about structural reform. There should be more structural reform. But we need to go a little bit softer on the budgetary austerity. I think the Commission is going softer now. It's not publicizing this fact, but that's all well and, well and good. Uh, the, the, second, the second problem I referred to was the uh, leadership problem. Well, here, France clearly needs to get its economy uh, sorted out so it can become a strong, influential country again and revive the Franco-German relationship. Britain needs to make clear that it's going to um, stay in the EU and its leaders need to campaign for that. Uh, the Commission needs a shake-up. The Commission needs, to, in my view, to appear to be less obsessed with its own power, become more focused, needs more economic expertise, more sense of priority. Um, and uh, the Germans, as I already said, need to have a greater sense of responsibility than they've had until now. And finally, you solve the legitimacy problem partly, partly through national parliaments. One of the trends of the EU in the last... Uh, 30, 40 years, is that governments have learned that they play not only national roles, they play European roles. And that's why the European Council is the dominant body in the EU today. Heads of state and government, when they go to the European Council, they have to think about their national electorates, but they also, within that framework of the Council, they think European. They understand they have shared interests, EU rules constrain them, balance of power politics in the EU constrains them. And that's all well and good, and that's why the European Council can and does take important pro-European decisions. Parliaments, national parliaments, somehow have to be involved in EU decision-making in the same way. They need to understand that they will play a national role, but they have to play a European role as well, alongside the European Parliament, which, of course, is not going to go away. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Charles. I just want to put one question, and it's just a yes or no answer I require. <laughs> will um, Britain be in the European Union in 2020? I'd say a 50-50 chance. <laughs> I didn't, so you said yes and no. Yes. <laughs> um, we began uh, uh, this panel with uh, uh, Minister Lajcik uh, reminding us that we, um, some of this is a crisis of confidence and that we shouldn't underestimate uh, uh, the achievements. And whenever I come to Central Europe, that's something I'm reminded of. You know, you couldn't... Uh, take a car from Vienna uh, to Bratislava uh, on these nice modern new roads without checkpoints and, uh, uh, and the rest. So uh, we need to be reminded of that. But we ended with Charles Grant, who I had hoped to be an optimist, saying that there were, we face uh, uh, three crises of uh, economics, of governance, and of legitimacy. And I think, of course, they're both right. Um, the question is where between them we, um, we find, and we've had some uh, interesting pointers. Just before I open it up, I just want to just ask each member of the, of, of the panel um, just very quickly um, what they think about one thing, because uh, as Big Brzezinski mentioned yesterday, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, and 
Uh, President Ilves mentioned the, the last American tank. Now, from my perspective, but this is perhaps just because I'm British, um, the, uh, the new trade and investment pact with the US is about the last chance for the Atlantic Alliance. If we can't do this over the next few years, we might as well give up, and you will find the US looking entirely across the Pacific. Um, and I detect some optimism uh, in the sense that the French, who, are, who have traditionally been um, uh, rather uh, against such a deal, now see uh, an opportunity to create a space from which which can set standards and from which Europe can defend itself against rising powers in, 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 in economic competition. Um, but I, my great fear is the chlorinated chicken. Um, this is uh, the, uh, the agricultural, one of the agricultural disputes. Uh, uh, in the US, um, they chlorinate their chickens before they eat them, bleach them, and we, we won't have them, apparently, in Brussels. I keep meeting people in Brussels saying we can't have chlorinated chickens. So is this my fear? Is, is this great enterprise going to fail because of hormones in beef and chlorinated chickens and other things? But I'd just like to ask each of you, how important, you know, where on your list of priorities, where, where, where do you put this project? Um, am I just being too Anglo-Saxon in saying that I think it's the most important thing externally for Europe or, or not. So and we'll just go along. Perhaps, so I'll start with Mr. Frattini. Well, uh, I would consider this a really top priority. You rightly said it may be the last chance. Uh, I think trade and investment agreement with the United States is not just about trade. It is about a concept which is to me a really a broad concept of global security you have to combine many elements. Economical elements are related to uh, improve competitiveness, uh, uh, abolishing barriers, obstacles, and so on and so forth. But it, it, it is related also to this principle of global security, for example, how to work together Europe and United States with the rest of the world. Think about Africa, which has been not mentioned. If America and EU get an agreement to uh, work together on these, they will be together much stronger to address poverty, mass migration, and to be a real united transatlantic interlocutor with the African continent, which is equally important that Asian continent, if I consider some global uh, uh, issues like desertification, protecting environment, mass migration. So this is a starting point. This is a precondition to succeed. If we miss that chance, uh, we will be failing as our small Europe cannot compete on the global scene. Uh President Ilves, I expect I know your views, but how do we make it happen as well? Well, clearly we will have to uh, make a number of compromises, come up with rules and regulations on how to get around these problems, but I, on the other hand, see that, uh, uh, that if we don't do this, uh, Europe, even Europe will be too small in the world. Uh, in that. Uh, and if you look at the rise of the BRICS, and the BRICS sort of not really adhering to rule of law, tolerating corruption, I, there are advantages to being a uh, non-rule-based uh, kleptocratic country, for the elite at least. And, uh, and we already, uh, Mr. Verdi mentioned Africa. I mean, if we look at their sort of African countries no longer follow the, uh, the anti-corruption rules of the, um, of the World Bank because they can get better loans cheaper from China. Uh, so what I see, I mean, I see, see two parts. One is that we have a, we do have a transatlantic trade agreement and a real meaningful one, one with teeth. The other side of this is this ridiculous situation that we have had for the last 25, 30, well, maybe less, but the fact that we have, if you're a defense minister in Europe and you belong to 
the EU, EU and NATO, which most of the defense ministers do in Europe. If you go to Eustace Lipsus and discuss defense, and then you drive across town to NATO, yeah. you cannot even talk to yourself. We are forbidden <laughs> to talk. I mean, defense ministers cannot, you cannot talk about the other, what you did in the other place. And if you're commanding, or if you're a president, you're commanding the same tanks, the same planes, the same troops, one for NATO, one for the EU. And so you have this split brain problem. And all of this, if you think of the, the community that exists between North America and Europe, uh, with, from, with Canada, US, put in Turkey, that's 900 million people. That's in the same order of magnitude as what the other BRIC type countries are like. And it's one based on democratic values, on rule of law, um, but we're not doing it. We're not doing it because of 900,000, an island of 900,000 blocking Turkey, when then in a tit for tat situation says, okay, well, if you're not gonna allow us to do, do things with the EU, we will not allow the EU to do anything with NATO, or NATO to do anything with the EU. This is, this is not a, uh, this, is, this is a rather silly situation. Fair, yeah. And when, if we think in the long term, then we have to do something about this. You know, I think it was, uh, yes, ministers, or polit <laughs> diplomacy is surviving to the next century. Politics is lasting until Friday afternoon. I mean, that's where, where we're confusing diplomacy with local politics. Will I, will I be in power, especially in a parliamentary system, will I be in power in three days? Unfortunately, this sort of precludes thinking about, will we be in existence in 50 years? So I would see a two-pronged thing. Okay, you know, right. security and the economics. Thank you. Mr. Sefcovic, is the, uh, the European Commission, which of course is central to this, absolutely pivotal, this is an area where the Commission is in the, in the vanguard, is it going to um, come up with these compromises that will be necessary to, is it gonna keep its sights on the bigger gains? absolutely do that and I hope that uh, the business community and uh, civic society will uh, definitely help us to push the, the decision maker and policy maker in that direction because for, for us in the Commission the potential EU-US uh, free trade agreement is a real game changer. Why? I mean we together uh, we produce uh, half of the, of, the, of the GDP we are the major investors in all parts uh, uh, of the world, but we are the major investors uh, towards uh, each other. For example, the US investments uh, in Europe are three times bigger than in all Asia. The, um, the European investments in the United States are eight times bigger than the European investments in China and India combined. The economic relationship is already so strong that uh, the two billion euros a day is just the, the, the reflection of what we have right now. But we are looking at the price, what we can get. It's not that much in, uh, in a further overling of the tariffs because the, the tariffs are quite low. It's uh, between two to four percent. But what we are looking for is uh, much better harmonization of the, of the uh, technical accounting, uh, legal and other standards because these are the back costs the businessmen have to face when, when they are on the European uh, or United States market. And this could slap additional uh, tariff between, or additional cost between 10 to 20%. And if you look beyond that, and I think that car industry is telling us that in, in their case, this, uh, this is even more than 20, 25% uh, of additional cost. So if we can move beyond this percentages point, what I think is extremely important is the fact that if we agree, the Americans and the Europeans, that this is the technical standard, it's almost automatically becoming the world standard. And I think this is such a price that I'm uh, just really surprised that we couldn't uh, do it earlier, that we couldn't overcome the, the differences uh, uh, we, uh, we have right now, and therefore you can, you can really count uh, on this in the Commission that we will do our utmost. We will, we will show our utmost creativity how to tackle all these problems because it will be very difficult negotiations. I just read this morning very good news. There was very good meeting between the European trade ministers in Dublin with uh, Mike Fromm, uh, the deputy national security advisor who is responsible uh, for, uh, for uh, these negotiations. 
We hope we will have a mandate uh, approved uh, under the Irish presidency in, in May or June. And we really want to start very, very intense uh, negotiations already this year and hopefully to have some kind of parts uh, of that agreement uh, initial agreed uh, before uh, the new commission uh, will arrive and will and, uh, and uh, will take over. What I think would be absolutely interesting, uh, important, uh, is what you have uh, what you have said at the beginning. We have to look beyond lactic acid. We have to look beyond chlorine chicken, and we have to keep this vision on the horizon. What is the price in it? How much we can achieve? And the fact that nor Americans nor uh, nor Europeans uh, do have better ally, better partner. Than, uh, than, than ourselves. We are the military allies. We have the same DNA if it comes to the rule of law, uh, to the, to the uh, respect uh, for labor codes, for environmental legislation, and so on and so forth. So the, 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 the ground is clearly there for having very good, ambitious agreement, which could be the game changer. We should really help, speaking on behalf, uh, I mean, in this case, of, uh, of the European Union, which should help us in, in Europe to preserve the, the, the leading position of the European Union in this globalized 21st century. Thank you. Uh, Minister Lechuk, do you, do you detect the same um, uh, enthusiasm and commitment in the Council of Ministers when you go to the Foreign Affairs Council? And um, is it going to be possible to um, put aside some of these uh, problems? Judging from the atmosphere, Yes, the Council of Ministers, I would say, it's important, but it's not vital. I wouldn't call it the last chance. We have lived quite comfortably without it. Uh, but now, well, first of all, it's normal that we should have this ambition to conclude this agreement, particularly when we are uh, living in crisis. Second, I wouldn't wish to think about the failure of this endeavor. So why, w once we started talking about it, and once we start doing it, we have no other option but to complete it, to accomplish it. Otherwise, it would uh, demonstrate that uh, the, the basis, the foundation of our relationship is not as strong as we tend to believe. So we need it. We need it for two reasons. First one is the substance. So it, it will bring uh, very significant benefits for both economies. And I fully agree with Commissioner Shevchuk that we, we really have to, to look big uh, and not be lost in details. And second, we need it also as a confirmation, as a strong signal uh, and demonstration of the fact that it's the EU and US who are the advocates and pioneers of the free trade and uh, who are the ones who are setting the global rules. Okay. Thank you. Charles. Uh, yes. Philip, it is hugely important, uh, particularly for the British debate on Europe, because if pro-Europeans can demonstrate that the EU adds value, delivers benefits, as I said earlier, through helping Britain get access or better access to foreign markets, including the US, then that's good for the debate in Britain. But let me set your question in a broader context. It's not just the US. Next week in uh, Tokyo, there's the beginning of the negotiation of the EU-Japan FTA, which is very important. Uh, there's one with India that's a bit stuck. There's one with Canada and Singapore that are close to finished but not finished. Uh, one of the problems, though, is back to the European Parliament. With, with Japan, with India, with Singapore, uh, Canada, each time the EU insists on human rights and weapons of mass destruction clauses in the agreements so that the EU has the right to suspend the agreement if the country concerned abuses human rights. The Indians say this is arrogant Western neo-imperialism. The Japanese say the same. And unless the EU, uh, in my view, softens its insistence on putting everybody in the same box with these FTAs, these, these deals risk being delayed. That's already delaying the Singapore and Canadian deals. So we're going to be insisting on American human rights. I don't know what well. they're going to do about that. They may well try. Yes. I wouldn't put it past the European <laughs> Parliament to try um, on that. Uh, I'm going to... Um, uh, throw the conversation outwards. Um, all I'd ask is that um, people say who they are, keep their comments, um, questions, statements uh, relatively briefly. Um, I think there are some microphones. I'm going to take this gentleman right on the front first and then this gentleman here. This gentleman on the front row. If we can see, uh, have we got a roving microphone somewhere? No, if you stand up, they could see. If you could stand up, sir. 
Could you stand up? So stand up. Stand up so they can see you. Sorry. Thank you. Geek loud. Thank you. I have two, two questions. One for... Sorry, Mr. who are you? Yes, I, I'm, I come from Spain. I'm Diego Lopez Garrido. I belong to the Spanish Parliament okay. and to the Parliamentary Assembly, NATO Parliamentary Assembly, as Vice President of the Mediterranean Group, Middle East Group. I have a, a question to Maros Sevcevic about, about the, the role of the Commission. Because we uh, envisage uh, that the, because of the crisis, and the, the leading role um, developed by, by the European Council because of the tough economic decisions, uh, rescue programs, etc. Um, probably the Commission have lost ground because uh, of the shift to an intergovernmental uh, mood in Europe. I'd like to know which is the, the opinion coming from uh, Maros Sepcevic about that. This is a question affecting the European architecture. Okay. Extra, extra treaties, it's a, it's, a, it's a fact, political fact. And the second question addressed to Mr. Franco Frattini, my friend Franco Frattini, about uh, solidarity. He mentioned solidarity. And uh, my question is, it is possible uh, to go ahead in Europe without Eurobonds? Is it possible to, to, to have a, a monetary union without Eurobonds and without, um, with the consequences of a, of a huge divergence between interest rate to be paid by Germany or Spain and Italy, so it's, a, it's a, uh, a challenge now, in my opinion, in Europe. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to take sort of three or four or five and then, and then come back to the panel. So this gentleman here. Thanks very much. Thank you. I'm Roland Freudenstein from the Center for European Studies in Brussels, and I admit I'm German. Uh, but that's good, because I just heard that I'm at home here. Uh, this is part of Greater Germany. So, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, <laughs> Charles, uh, that, that, was, uh, that was quite a deep um, a critique of, of the German government and uh, uh, the German mentality and the Chancellor above all. Um, so I'm not even trying to dig myself out of that hole. But, nevertheless, um, see the one thing that I would disagree with is that this, uh, as you call it, austerity, I would prefer fiscal consolidation, that this is all done only for the benefit of the German taxpayer. What I do admit is that it may look like that precisely for the reason that you, that you gave, um, that Germans at the moment do not really have the habit of communicating uh, like the great power that they allegedly are. Um, th there's, a, there's a time lag there. No, let, let's get, let us get used to that situation. But the accusation that Angela Merkel is acting, or the German government is acting here only on behalf of uh, German citizens and taxpayers, and do not believe that fiscal consolidation is a necessity, that we have a window of opportunity here, that we've been living uh, that we've been printing too much money for decades, that Keynesianism is not sustainable, and that we have a responsibility vis-a-vis -vis future generations. You know, I mean, all this is the rationale for what is happening. So we can argue about whether this is right or wrong. I'm absolutely ready, but I, I'm afraid that, uh, that this session would not, uh, would not have enough time for that. But what I do mind is the accusation that all this is egoistic, uh, pandering to the moods of German voters and taxpayers. I think it's a completely counterproductive accusation. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, I'm going to take the gentleman, <laughs> gentleman here, the lady there, and then there was one over there I saw, but uh, so the gentleman here, and then the lady behind, and then yes, this um, gentleman over I'm there. I'm Konstantin Eggers from Moscow. Um, my question is to uh, President Ilves. 
Um, we talk about redesigning Europe, first of all. I think uh, you hear about that for the last, whatever, 15 years I've been going to conferences. Every year we redesign Europe. But the question is, um, in your personal view, uh, do you think the set of uh, tasks that was discussed by the panel or that was proposed by the panel uh, is compatible with further enlargement of the European Union? I've heard some people here say that even Croatia is probably one too much uh, for the Union to handle. Uh, and if you look at the Romanian and Bulgarian experience, it's not been pleasant for the EU. So is the task of redesigning Europe at all compatible with adding more and more and more countries, including the thoroughly corrupt Balkan countries, uh, to the roster? Thank you. Thank you. The lady here. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Anna Jartfeldt. I'm the director of the Swedish Institute for International Affairs. I wanted to get back to one question that uh, some of you have uh, briefly mentioned, but I think it's uh, meriting maybe a little bit further reflection. And that is that maybe we are moving out of, an economic, uh, of the economic crisis, but more and more people are talking about that the European Union is now living in a de democratic crisis. And now if we are moving ahead on uh, integrating in even further areas, uh, I would like you to ask, answer and reflect a little bit more on how are we going to, sh to, to answer up to these democratic challenges? How is the European Union going to be closer to its citizens? And uh, what kind of reforms are going to be necessary on the, in the democratic area? Thank you. And then there was a gentleman there, if you could start. You. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, my, my name is Stefano Stefanini. I'm the outgoing diplomatic advisor to the outgoing president of Italy. Uh, I, uh, I agree with Charles Grant about the three crises. Uh, actually, uh, I, th I thank you for using the word uh, uh, legitimacy, institutions legitimacy, rather than uh, uh, democratic deficit. But I still think there is one phrase that captures the real problem of your skepticism, but also, which is, uh, uh, it's the economy stupid. And I would, I would ask to any one of the panel uh, to make the same case with, uh, that yesterday, I think Dr. Brzezinski made very <coughs> effectively about the uh, European unity on political or geopolitical grounds. If you, uh, Europe has to be united, if, uh, if it matters, I think what uh, Dr. Brzezinski said yesterday about Russia can easily apply to uh, any big or, uh, European country about uh, if, if, if we don't unite, that we become satellite of uh, somebody else. Uh, can, you make this, can you make the same ground on economic ground? Uh, can you make the same case on economic grounds that f for European unity? Meaning that, uh, and when I, when I talk about the economy, I'm not talking about saving the euro, I'm talking about uh, jobs, productivity, growth, uh, innovation. Are we better off uh, as a unity or national policies could be more effective in this situation. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we've got an array of fascinating comments and uh, <coughs> questions from the balance between intergovernmentalism and the community method. Uh, should we have euro bonds? Um, should we stop blaming Germany? Um, is, does the union have the capacity anymore uh, to enlarge? Are we facing <coughs> Uh, a democratic crisis in the wake of the economic crisis and are we better hanging together economically uh, than hanging uh, separately? I'd like, we've got about 13 or 14 minutes, I'd like to get a few more questions, but so if each of the panelists could just sort of choose one of those and answer for a minute and then we can get a few more um, before wrapping up if that's possible. So why don't we just start at the end, Charles, and we'll just run along. Choose, okay. choose your question, answer it succinctly and within a minute. Okay, a half a minute on two questions. On the last question from Stefano, um, I don't think it's necessary to have a centralized economic super state. If it was, it wouldn't work because the peoples are not ready for it. Already, with the current system, national parliaments have lost the freedom to set their own budget deficits. Those decisions are now taken by EU institutions. Uh, that is quite difficult to, uh, to justify in legitimacy terms. And I think if you go further and centralize more economic policies in EU, uh, it wouldn't work. And but luckily, I think the euro can survive without going 
that far towards centralization. On the point about uh, Germany from Roland, I don't think that, uh, you know, think back to the first Greek bailout. Was it 2009, 2010? We all know it was delayed because of the North Rhine-Westphalia land election. And that's, that's why it was delayed. And everybody knows that. And Mrs. Merkel's advisors admit that. So all through, Germany has delayed things and prevaricated. And right now, why is Germany backsliding on the commitment to a bank resolution regime? Because we've got to wait for September's elections. Now, I'm not saying... German politicians are worse than the other politicians in the world. They're not. They're just the same. All politicians think about elections. All politicians try and put off difficult decisions. But the result risks with the Eurozone destabilizing the whole system. Um, I do think that the Germans are, and you and your analysis are wrong to think the only problem is breaking rules. That's part of it. Greece broke the budget rules. Ireland did not. Spain did not break the rules. Spain had a budget surplus when the crisis okay. began. It, rules is part of it, but you've got to look at the macroeconomics. You've got to look at the economic imbalances. If Germany has a massive trade surplus, that contributes to the imbalances. They, they shouldn't think it's only other people's problems. They are part of the problem, too. Um. Mr. Lechek, we are on this panel dining a la carte, so you could just choose which, yes, uh, yes. which uh, question uh, you would like. First, I have no problem uh, being part of either Germany. Uh, second, solidarity <laughs> is a, a founding stone of the European Union, but it's, it must go hand in hand with responsibility. We cannot ask for solidarity if we are not responsible with ourselves and with our partners. That's really important. We, we can ask for solidarity if we demonstrate that we are doing our homework and we have uh, respected the rules. Otherwise, it, it, it won't worry. Uh, redesigning Europe is in no way in conflict with the EU's enlargement. EU's enlargement is a process that we own, we define, and I see absolutely no, no impact. Uh, uh, on the contrary, well, it's not the so-called new member states that caused the crisis, uh, with the exception of Cyprus, whose uh, banking system was well, uh, seen as uh, completely in line with European standards at the time when Cyprus joined the, uh, the EU, but it's not the former communist countries who have brought the, the, the crisis into the European Union. So I see absolutely no, no linkage. Uh, and as I said, we control the process, so we should give green light when we are absolutely sure that the new member states are, are ready to make us stronger and more efficient. Uh, don't, don't, don't make our, ourselves scared of the process of enlargement. And I don't think we are facing democratic crisis. We are facing a major changes. We are fixing the economic flaws. And it, 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 it's clear we will not stop in the domain of economy. It needs an element of political union. It needs more Europe, deeper integration. So these, we are in the transition phase right now. It's not the end game yet. And this is, what, this is why what, we, what my look at the democratic crisis right now, it, it's, I, I really think, the temporary stage. Thank you. Mr. Sefkozic. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Diego asked me the question about the, the role of the Commission and about the perception uh, that the Commission is weakened in comparison with, uh, uh, with the, the Commissions of the, uh, of the past. I think that uh, we're going through the, through the natural process of the uh, standard relationship between the executive and uh, democratic accountability. Yes, the Lisbon Treaty is in place. Yes, we are accountable. Uh, to, the, to the European uh, Parliament. And on top of it, I think because of the crisis, we are already the uh, second or third year in crisis management where the highly visible and prominent role was played by the, by the European Council. So to tell the truth, yes, we had to fight for our uh, prerogatives. We had to fight for the respect uh, of European rules, be it uh, attempts from various countries to, uh, to introduce some new protectionism uh, in Europe, to not respect uh, the rules, as uh, Franco Frattini was mentioning. And um, we had to introduce the complete new set of rules in, uh, in economic governance. If you look, as Charles said, uh, uh, at the role of the Commission, from the legal point of view, the Commission never in, the, in its uh, history had more power than it has right now. The question is, uh, do the Member States uh, want uh, this to be so visible? Do they want to have the, the Commission with such a high profile or not? And I think this is the, uh, the question also to the, uh, to the leaders, uh, because uh, when we see um, how big implementation gap we have in Europe. Very often the decisions taken on the level of the European Council 
in, in, in most cases on the proposal of the Commission, how long does it take us to really implement them? How many backtracking do we have? I mean, uh, the Charles mentioned banking union. I can, I can name dozens and dozens of, of examples. So I think that uh, to improve uh, the efficiency of the union and improve the, 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 the functioning of the European Commission, I think this, will, this must be a really common effort because the European Commission is here for all, for all member states and for the European citizens. Just one comment on, on, on Germany, because here also I cannot agree with, uh, with Charles. I think um, it was quite clear that if, if everything was so well uh, with Spain and Ireland, I don't think they would have this problem. And I don't think that Germany caused the problem of, of Ireland and Spain. Simply, there has been unhealthy policies where some sectors simply uh, really grew out of proportion because of the lack of healthy economic management and economic governance. Which country's banks Can lent the most to Ireland and Spain? German mm -hmm. banks. But you know, you Fact. cannot say that, that the that Germany was the reason of the, the problems for Spain and Ireland. And I, what I, what I, yeah, just, just, but I, what I want to say is that in all of the, the programs of the solidarity, almost one third of this old money is coming from, from the Germany. And I, I'm not surprised that uh, uh, that you want to create the system where this crisis will not repeat itself. Therefore, we are setting completely new set of rules, uh, a, a new set of, uh, of controlling mechanisms, because I'm not surprised that if you want to invest in the project, you want to be sure that it's, it's a healthy project of the, uh, of the, of the future. Now, we're and running out of time. Can, yeah, can so, I really so therefore, I, uh, therefore, I think that we have to look what was the alternative to these policies. Who would lend to these okay, countries? We, how they would, how they would uh, reconstruct the economies without the help uh, of the European Union, where the Germany in that case was quite crucial. One. President Tilvis. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you, Kostya. You left me without choice. You must be a Russian. Uh, <laughs> Well, I think that, yes, first of all, there are legal problems because in France and Austria, you, you need, after the Croatian accession, uh, referenda on new accessions, and that's in the Constitution. So, so that's one problem. Uh, I think that, in fact, the Western, uh, more Western countries of the, uh, of the Union and are disinclined to, uh, to proceed full speed ahead on enlargement. I, on the other hand, I, where is the constituency for enlargement? I would say it is uh, the V4 plus 3B, which is already amounts in population to about a Germany, plus the Nordic countries, which is even more than, so that there you have about 100 million people. That is a big, I mean, I think that there are whole areas where that constellation, the constellation of the Visegrad Four, the Three Balts, and the Nordics, which think on a lot of issues the same way, be it on the internal market or deepening the internal market, uh, not hating the United States, feeling a responsibility for, for the countries in our neighborhood, all these things we share in common. And I would say that more broadly, what we need to see much, much more is sort of is cooperation, I mean, just political, serious political cooperation on key, the issues we consider key in Europe that our neighbors consider key in Europe and to push them through. And that means enlargement, it means Turkey, it means the Eastern partnership and having a stronger position on countries that are either moving well or moving badly. Uh, similarly with TAFTA, I mean, TAFTA is quite big, I think, in the, the 100 million I just mentioned. So I think that what we need, uh, especially coming up in the future, where we, in this round, you know, we're still called new members 10 years after joining the European Union. Do we call the neutrals new members? I mean, when they, 10 years after the, uh, af I mean, after Finland, Austria, and Sweden joined, no one called them the new members. We're still the new members. We still are the new members when it comes to common agricultural policy, even though the internal market, tractors, fuel, seeds, everything costs the same, but we'll disregard the fact that this is unfair competition. I mean, the point is we have to, overall, this is one issue, but there are all these other issues where the V, Four, the B3 and the N3 need to have a much stronger, stronger position, common position. Okay. Um, I'd hope to get some more questions, but this is actually going to be, I'm afraid, because I've been instructed that we've got to end on time. So um, 
Uh, Mr. Frattini uh, takes the last uh, word. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Diego asked me a very interesting question on eurobonds. My answer is the following. First of all, eurobonds are not a subsidy. These are projects that should be used for common European initiatives to create growth for all. This is the first. Secondly, solidarity. It has been said, solidarity is one of the pillars of European project, but there is a precondition that those, all those that are asking for solidarity respect first common rules. This is a precondition to reassure all those that are a bit reluctant on interpreting this concept of solidarity between uh, subsidizing uh, states in need and common interests. I think solidarity is a common interest, is a common pillar of our project. I, I think about my country, Italy will be out as from the months of May from the procedure for excessive deficit, thanks to the efforts undertaken by the Italian government. And this is why we have been insisting on having euro bonds not as a concession, but part of a common project for European growth. Uh, a second just a word on European uh, credibility and deficit of democracy, because uh, the, the, the point is crucial and, and nobody talk about that. My idea is that we need first transparency. We need secondly, public communication to the people, because uh, it's not possible uh, to say to the citizens, you have to follow what European institutions, be the parliament, be the commission, the council will have decide without having a say in choosing those that will be representing the institution. Uh, many, of, very often, the leaders are chosen in a secret room by a number, restricted number of leaders. This is the precondition to try to fill the gap in terms of democratic credibility of European institutions. Thank you, um, and thank you uh, to all the panelists. I'm not sure in that last uh, lively exchange we answered the German question, but um, European states, uh, men and women, have been trying to do that for 150 years or so. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I took from this uh, great session a, a sense that uh, it's not so much a, a vision that we need, but a series of work programs, and programs that uh, uh, combine uh, solidarity, but also, as Mr. Frattini just said, responsibility um, that combine looking outwards to the US, but also uh, to our near abroad, to the Balkans, um, with our uh, global ambitions, and also, as Charles Grant said, uh, uh, looking to Asia and trade agreements and other things there. But um, uh, I'm sorry we didn't take uh, uh, more questions, but I thought the panel were absolutely fascinating. So I think if we could all thank them, that would be great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.